to hear. Man, it's good to be home. All right? It is good to be back. We have uh, enjoyed our trip, but um, I am just one of those people, I kind of like routine. When I get out of routine, my whole world shuts down, and uh, I don't handle it well. So um, I am glad to be back. I'm sure I gained about 15 pounds, but that's okay. And uh, we are ex just excited. Uh, I was just excited about getting to church this morning. It really was. Um, if you see me dragging a little bit, I'm on day two of no caffeine. Um, it is not an easy life, all right? I'm going to say that. Uh, man, I have enjoyed, me and Mountain Dew have been best friends for um, 30 years, all right? And uh, we have got, had this love-hate relationship. I love the taste. I love the caffeine. And he loves to put the pounds on me, all right? And become very dependent. And uh, so if you were, Roz asked me earlier if, if I'm making any resolutions. And I, I have a yes, no to that. It's kind of semantic. I don't like resolutions because resolutions always get broken. I mean, has anyone here made a resolution for this year? If you've made a resolution, raise your hand. All right, if you've broken the resolution, raise your hand. All right, <laughs> we're day three. We are day three, and uh, it just doesn't happen that way. So years ago, I decided I'm going to change my goals from resolutions uh, or my things from resolutions to just really commitments before God. And uh, it's really a new beginning. And that's what you think about January, you think about resolutions, you think about a new beginning, okay? 2015 is gone, and we are now just beginning. I mean, we are still 363 days. I got corrected the other day because it was leap year. 363 more days of this year are still to come. We have a brand new beginning of what we can see God do this year. And I fully believe in my life, my family's life, our church, the, the Church of, of uh, Family of Faith Fellowship, is that God, the best year ever to come in, the, in our lives is 2016. I don't, and it, it, sometimes you think that, like, wait, we saw this happen, we saw that happen at this time, or, or y'all are going through, like, yes, please, because we lost our pastor this past year, we're looking forward to it, I get it, all right? But I think 2016, more than any other year, could be a year that God changes the face of Chandler, Gilbert, Queen Creek, Phoenix, and the world if we'll just surrender to him. And really, so this passage, we're in, we're in the book chapter, uh, the book of John, chapter 2 again. Uh, the book of John is the fourth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. We're looking at the second chapter. And I have looked at, I studied for a couple of days in Georgia. I've been studying the last couple of days, and I have literally written at least four different outlines for this one passage. And every time I get done looking at it, I'm like, it doesn't fit. Something's just not, I had an uneasiness in my spirit. So normally you see me walk up here with these like three or four big eight and a half by 11. Last night, this is what I wrote out. That's my notes. And um, I'm just going to speak to you from my heart today. I'm going to speak to you from what God, I'm going to re read this passage. We're going to look at it. I'm going to show you what God's taught me in it. And I'm just going to point out a few things. It's very simple. We may be out of here super early and get a good lunch early, all right? Um, I have to go to Chuck E. Cheese Pizza. All right. Um, <laughs> for somebody's birthday that's what she wants we are excited to celebrate that all right um but god's just doing something new in me when you think about new, re new why do we make resolutions why do we need a new beginning because something in the past wasn't quite right something in the past didn't quite add up something in the past is a pain that you want to get pat away from so you're hoping for a new a fresh start that's why we have New Year's res resolutions. That's why we want transformation in our lives. Yeah, I've stopped drinking caffeine, but that is a small goal commitment I've made for this. Actually, I didn't make that for the whole year. I told my wife there was a designated time. When that time is up, I'm hoping I've kicked it. If not, I'm going back. Um, and she's shaking her head like, you better not. Um, <laughs> I made commitments this year that are not about me, it's about God in me and how I really want to change. Only people that know about my commitments are Amber and my accountability partners I'll meet with this week. Those are the only people who are going to know because these are things I need, I need to write them out and I had to just make those commitments. And I'm challenging you to do the same thing. When we look at this, we're seeing a newness come about. We're seeing a few different things pop out. And as I think about the story, I started thinking about the story. This is one that my mind kind of likes to rumble. 
and likes to imagine things, all right? I told y'all I love movies and TV shows, all those things. So I try to think about what would this TV show be like from the position of a servant on this day at this wedding feast? All right, so this servant, he's, he's working at this massive wedding feast. And wedding feasts back then, they did wedding feasts right. It wasn't just a, hey, here's a wedding. Let's go grab dinner, have a glass of champagne. Let's go, we're done. It was three, four, five, six, seven days long, depending on the family and the amount and where the people that were there. I mean, they flat threw down, all right? And I'm all for that, all right? So if you ever want to have a wedding feast like that, just let me know. The food's on you, so I'm liking it. Um, no. <laughs> But they were going at it, and this servant is sitting there, and he's grabbing the last bottle of wine, and he's seeing this party, and he's thinking, oh, no, this is our last bottle. What, what do I do? How, what's going to happen here? Because people could revolt. People can get upset. The groom, who's on the happiest day of his life, he may get sued for this. This happened in that time that if you didn't have enough wine and the party wasn't right, you could get sued. If he gets sued, if I'm going to get paid for my work today, what's going to happen? I'm str he's concerned. What's the, what's the hostility going to be? And he grabs that last bottle and he hands it to the other servant and they go to pour the last drinks. Yet tons of people are still waiting to get their next lit amount of alcohol, the next drink to encourage the party to go on and on. We don't have a picture that it was a crazy uh, wild party. We just have a picture it was a wild, a, a good, encouraging, loving, fun time. That's all we get a, seat, a picture of. And this servant is sitting there. He's, he's kind of, he's figuring out, what do, I, what do I do next? How do I help try to appease this? And in the back, right behind him, he hears this woman talking. And she's talking to her son. And her son says, what, what? She's asking him, take care of this for me. And he, he's like, what, what, it's not my responsibility. Why, why are you asking, why are you bothering me with this? And, what, and it kind of separates himself from her and the situation and you kind of see her in a resolute voice kind of say i i understand and then the, she looked at me and she asked me as a servant do whatever he tells but i'm sitting here thinking he just said he's not going to do anything what do you mean do whatever he says what am i supposed to do and then the guy looks at me and says hey grab the other servants see those stone jars over there fill them to the brim and on each of these stone jars, we had to go and we had to go get other jars and fill these things up. Each one held 20 to 30 pounds, gallons of water. It was anywhere between 200 and 280 pounds worth of, uh, between the stone jar and the water itself, as heavy as could be. It was at the very max capacity. And then this guy has the audacity to tell me, who I've been serving wine, I know that's all people want, to take a glass and take it to the headmaster. And I'm supposed to take this to that guy? That guy wants wine. He could have my head. He could put me in jail. He could... He could, he could get me fired. He could, all these things could happen to me. You want me to take a glass of water to the headmaster? No way. But in my obedience, I just followed what that guy said. And in that moment, I give the water to the headmaster, and he takes a first sip, and we stop right there. That's a small glimpse of what was happening in the midst of the story. In the midst of the story is new, a, a number of people, but only a few people knew exactly what happened. In fact, Mary doesn't even know what happened. The servants, the disciples, and Jesus were the only people know how this story actually happened. But it ushers in a brand new beginning. So let's read this chapter. Let's read chapter two, verse through tw chapter two, verses one through verse twelve, and let's look at what really happens here. And I'm going to probably stop and pause and talk a little bit through this. All right. It says, on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. Now, so we get a glimpse here. Obviously, whoever this wedding was for, now this is only like, I think like an eight-mile trek from Galilee to Cana of Galilee. It's like not very far from each other. So they're really kind of close. And obviously, we don't know if it was a family member of Jesus or just a, a good friend or what it is, but obviously it was someone who knew Mary and we always see, they, Mary knew them well enough as we read on the story that she's concerned about the wine. She's concerned about how this family's going to be viewed if this party doesn't go off without a hitch. She's concerned. So there, there's, there's a relational aspect here between the family hosting this party and then Mary and Jesus and his disciples. All right. And in verse, picking up verse 3, it says, When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now we see here, I, I think one of the things we love about this 
I look at this, this one little section right here. It says, they had no wine. We see Mary as a very compassionate mother. You, as you read scripture, she's a compassionate mother. Every time we see her, she's compa- she has a compassionate heart. And um, then it goes on, and she, and she says, they have no wine. And I kind of have to wonder, as I read this, and I, a couple of scholars I, I, I read in studying this passage kind of touched on it. So who at this point in, in this journey, you think about this, the people who knew who Jesus was, the disciples, Mary, John the Baptist, its only a handful of people, knew who Jesus was. And reality is, we'll see later, the disciples just knew about him. They didn't even have their faith in him. They just had faith about who he might be. I kind of wonder as I read this, do you think Mary was like, all right, they've got no wine. Here's a chance for you to show what you can do. Let's get it done. Let's show the world that you came to conquer it. I kind of wonder. I kind of think. And so often I think about when I set New Year's resolutions or I set goals. I'm all about, all right, God, let's show what you can do. do work through me. That's all I want to see is you working through me. And reality is most of that's really about God wanting, I wanting God to work through me rather than work God in me. I want me to get recognized for what God did in me rather than God getting recognized, recognition. So it sounds kind of harsh in what, what Jesus says next. They have no wine. And Jesus responds to her and said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? Uh, with me my hour has not yet come now i don't know about y'all my mom was here a while back one of the sweetest ladies beautiful smile hopefully she's going to stay with us soon very tender-hearted but if i ever called my mom woman i would be through that wall the next wall and the next wall there ain't no way <laughs> i'm going to be able to live through calling my mom woman and once my dad heard about it i'm even more dead I mean, it's just not going to end up well at all. And as I read this, I was like, how is Jesus? It, almost, it really sounds disrespectful, doesn't it? Woman, what does this have to do with me? It, it just, it sounds so disrespectful. So as I studied, I was like, all right, I've got to understand this because there's no way Jesus is going to set a standard of being disrespectful to his mother. That's just not right. All right, St- children, listen to this. You cannot disrespect your parents, okay? All right. All right, good job. <laughs> And as you study this more, this is a very common phrase. It was not a disrespectful phrase. In fact, he uses the same phrase when he's on the cross talking to John and says, take care of this woman. He was designating who she was. And we start to see a shift here. This is where a turn happens. This is one of the three things I wrote down that I saw a change in the midst of life. For so long... G- Mary was the mother of Jesus. And so long, Jesus was, Mary and Mary s- was Mary's son. But now, the shift is starting to happen to where Mary kind of told Jesus what to do in life. Because for, all, for what we know, we, we, later on, the, the story tells us this is the very first sign. So we have no record of Jesus ever performing a miracle before this time. She didn't know he could or what he would do. It's one of my favorite songs at Christmas time is Mary Did You Know. All right. We've got a friend of ours that sings it, and it is without question my favorite, con- my favorite track to listen to. We see this shift in Mary from mother of Jesus to follower of Jesus. Because Jesus says, he, he says there, he says, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. What does this have to do with me? He's distancing himself. He says, I understand that's important to this moment, but that is not important to all eternity. I'm not coming here to make myself known as a magician performing tricks. I'm coming to make my father known. And then he says there, he says, my hour has not yet come. My hour, the whole breath of Jesus' life was all about the day he would die on the cross. This is the very beginning of his ministry that we have public ministry of. And yet, even from the very beginning, he was focused on the cross. I think so often as I read through this passage, I think about that, how much I am not just focused on my life for Christ. How often I get so sidetracked by other things. But how thankful I am I had a a heavenly father, a savior, who was focused on what he was called to do and did not waver one bit. 
So in this interaction between Mary and Jesus, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. The shift goes from her telling the servants to do this to helping with the family. Kind of, if, she's, if she has authority to tell, say something to the servants, she probably had some authority in the midst of this wedding. She shifted from being the mother of Jesus to being a follower of Jesus and passed all honor, all leadership, all authority, all praise to her son Jesus in this moment. You never again see her trying to guide and direct Jesus. We never have another passage or story that tells us like that. In this moment, you see a massive shift where she is now just no longer the mother of Jesus, but a follower of Jesus and passing authority and honor to him. As you start this new beginning, I am challenging you. Start this new year. I'm encouraged. And, I, and please understand that right now there is a mirror in front of my face. I have been struggling through this passage like I haven't before. I almost last night pulled out an old message and completely changed today because I don't, a lot of times don't like preaching things that God hasn't fully worked out in me. But know that in the midst of I'm speaking this, there's a mirror in front of me. I am working this out. So I am working out that this year inside of me, in everything I do, whether it's my home, my family, my friends, my employment, whatever it is, that I will be recognized as one that gives all credit, all authority to Jesus. That's one of the greatest new beginnings you can do, is just passing all that authority to Christ. The story goes on from there. And here's where a, a breath of everything that happens is right here. And it picks up in verse 6. It says, now there were six stone jar water jars there for this Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. So in the midst of the story, we're picking up right here. Jesus says these, sto these stone jars were used for purification. What was so important about them used for being purification? Well, the rituals of Jews, and I looked this up, and I'd heard it before, and I wanted to confirm. There were 613 different laws at this time in the history that the Jews were supposed to follow. I can't even follow those 10. Don't add 603 more, all right? I mean, I have a hard time with the three, the 10 that we started out with. 613 laws, and one of those laws was before, before eating, you had to walk. Pour cups of water on your, hand, on your left hand twice. Pour cups of water on your right hand twice. There was a whole purification. And the reason they did that was so that people would remember, I, need, I am dirty and I am in need of a Savior. That, it was a reason they, they used these purification things. And it's really interesting that Jesus chose to use those jars. He could have said, hey, go get a, get a, get a bottle out of the kitchen. We'll, we'll do that. Hey, you think about Old Testament. He could have said, hey, just like the woman in the desert that filled the oils of, jars of oil and provided for her and her family to eat and just kept flowing and kept flowing and kept flowing. He could have done it that way, but instead he uses these jars, these six jars with 20 to 30 gallons in each and every one of them uh, to provide that was used for, pur for, for purification. There's a shift happening here. Just like there was a shift from Mary, his mother, his mother of Jesus, to follower of Jesus, there is now a shift that Jesus is saying, the old laws are incomplete. I am coming to make it complete. Jesus is now, now stating, I am the one. Remember, this is not a public act. Remember, the only people that knew about this is the servants, the disciples, and Jesus. That's it. He didn't start out his, his massive public ministry with tons of people knowing about it. But he let, let us know, John lets us know in, the, in writing the story that the old laws, that our ways are not good enough. Our works will never before, make it before Christ. And y'all, there, there's one thing we could start out 2016 really well with. It's making that shift in our mind. If I were to ask any of us in here, if you've grown up in church, you kind of understand church a little bit, understand what the Bible says, hey, will your works get you there enough? You would say, no, I need Jesus, Right? Okay, how do you live your life though? How often do we live and say, if I read my Bible, if I do this, God is happy with me, he is pleased with me, he'll provide for me. But if I struggle with whatever the addiction may be, if I struggle with anger, if I struggle with this, God is upset with me and God views me as a lesser person. But yet the scripture teaches us, guys, that he is whole, he is mighty, he is the one that views you as complete before God. You are perfect 
period. Listen, you are perfect, period. My friend, we went and visited a friend of mine's church while we were home. He used a great illustration to understand this. He talked about Santa. His son had to write a letter to Santa for school project. And uh, his son wrote, and Santa, I've been a really good boy, for, boy this year. I hope that you'll uh, give me these gifts and because, I, because I've been good. And we talked about how Santa's kind of creepy because he knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're not. That's a little bit, little bit weird, all right? Uh, only people that should know that is the parents. But he said, you know what? He couldn't write the letter back because he didn't. To, from Santa, because the, the, the school story was he was supposed. The parents were supposed to help Santa out because Santa's overrun with Christmas letters. The parents were going to help him out and write back to the uh, the kids. So my friend Jr. wrote back and said, "Son, I'm going to give you gifts not because you earned them. I'm going to give you things, but because you are my son. Because in my eyes you are perfect, whether good or bad. I love you." Guys, that's the reality of the life with Jesus. Whether good or bad, Jesus loves you. And in him and him alone will he make us complete. Those purification jars that they used to try to make themselves holy, to try to remember why they needed a Savior one day, a Messiah to come, that they were hoping to come. They re- Jesus was saying, look, I provide, and I make you whole, and I I am the new Lord. I am the God. As we start 2016, one, we talked about with Mary, just follow Jesus. It's not about you. Let all authority, all glory, all honor, all praise go to Jesus. Secondly, let's move from what I do to resting in what God has done. Because he's done the work. We don't get a picture here that Jesus went over to the jars and was like, abracazabra, abracazam, gaboo, and there was water of the wine. We have no picture of that. In fact, it's based on what John tells us, Jesus never got close to the, bo- the jars. Jesus never touched the jars. Jesus never touched the bottle, that, that wa- the glass he took the, the, the wine into the headmaster. Never touched it. We see here that Jesus has authority over all creation, and he connects himself to creation. One of the neat things I read about this, as a side note, is that it was six jars. How many days of creation was there? Six days of creation. We see six quite often in the Bible. It reminds us that God created everything. He has authority over everything. Let's start 2016 with a new beginning on that God is in control of it all. So we walk on there. And it says they filled them up to the brim. And in verse 8, it says, He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the headmaster, to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called for the bridegroom. Now, if I was that servant, remember earlier, I was telling a story. Even a servant, we don't even know that the servant knew that it was wine yet. The servant could very easily think it's still water. And if I'm that servant, and I've just handed this headmaster this wine glass of the uncertainty that he's drinking water or what he's drinking, and he immediately calls for the headmaster or for the groom, the the leader of the party, I'm starting to get a little nervous. I'm starting to freak out a little bit, like, uh-oh, he's really upset. And if he knew where it came from, the dirty gla- the dirty jar I brought this out of, he's going to get more upset, all right? He, if he doesn't know, if he knows where this came from, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen? I'm, I'm freaking out. And yet, in that moment, he hears the testimony of God that he turned water to wine and made it whole. And made it, in fact, the headmaster goes on to proclaim when the groom comes over. And he said, and he says to the bridegroom, he said to him in verse uh, verse 10, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. 
for years, they had a laws that pointed them to Jesus, that pointed them to a coming Messiah that was incomplete. And now the greatest thing ever is in their midst, the purification of Jesus Christ. One of the things I noticed on here, that's a big party. But there were six stone jars. Let's say each one held 20. That's 120 gallons of wine. I ain't never been to a party that went through that many bottles of wine. Not only is Jesus here showing that he can make everything right, he gives abundance of what we need. Think about this new family, this bride and groom. They're just starting out. This party gets over. They still have 50, 60, 80 gallons of wine they can sell to provide for their family. And God doesn't, in this 2016, don't just hope. Don't just think, man, God's going to take care of things. It, um, Sebastian said it very well in our Sunday class this morning. We talked about praying for things this 2016. Be specific. Be very specific in what you're praying for. And let God do something amazing and I promise you, it will come in abundance. Maybe this is the year that you say, you know what? I want to get right with God, and I want to be obedient with my, my time, my talents, and my treasure. I promise you, you will have more time than you've ever had. You will have more, tre you will have more talents. You'll, you'll realize you're better at things than you thought you were. And when you're obedient with your money and tithing, you will have more money than you've ever had before doesn't mean you're flowing, you're ready to go on a trip to Mexico. It means that you're provided for. And the peace and the joy of Christ this year will reign in your life like never before if you will set him as Lord to follow him. And you will trust that he's the one that's done all the work and you don't have to do any work. Think of all the people who are blessed. Did they do anything to earn that extra wine? No. God provided it. Lastly, it says here, in verse 11, it says, the first of his, and this, the first of his signs, we'll see as we go through the book of John, there were seven different signs pointing to the fact that Jesus is the one true God. Seven different times. Jesus did at Canaan and Galilee and manifested his glory. And the last little thing here, it says, and his disciples believed in him. Now, that caught me off guard. Because they were already following him. We've got at least five, six disciples here already following him. They left, they walked eight miles. I ain't walking eight miles for nobody if I don't believe something about them or in them. They believed about them. They were following him. But now, they, they've seen this miracle. They now believe in him. 2016. I pray that this year would be a year that each one of us don't just believe about God, but you believe in God. There, there's got to be a new beginning there. And you know what? Here's reality. I, for me, let me, just, let me just be vulnerable, Okay. I'll try to be as transparent as I can. I have believed about God since I was a little kid. I grew up in a home where my dad was a pastor. My mom taught. My, we ran a Christian campground. My dad was, you know, was just, I was inundated with it. I always believed there was God. When I was seven years old, I prayed, hey, God, save me, because I knew that I needed to say that prayer so I'd go to heaven, not to hell, because that's a scary place to go. It was all about believing about God. And reality is, until I was 20 years old, I believed about God enough that um, I believed about him enough to send me to hell. It was all here. It wasn't until I was 20 years old that I heard the message, you know, the night that I, I, I freaked out. I jumped in my car. I started running away from God as I heard the message, a story of Jesus loving me, loved me enough that he would die on a cross for my sins, loved me enough that he would live a perfect life, loved me enough to be beaten and, and put on that cross and then raise again three days later. I heard that story that I'd heard so many times before, and I tried to run away from it because I wanted to live my life. But as I was running away, I had to surrender and say, no longer, God, I give up. My life is yours. I went to believing about him to believing in him. 
But let me be honest with you. Here's where it gets transparent. There are days in my Christian walk now that I believe about God, but I don't believe in him because I try to work things out to figure it out myself. One of my commitments this year is no whole bars believing in God that he'll do the work. That doesn't mean that I am absentee, that I just get to go and sit on my couch all year. That'd be crazy. God wants us part of this plan. That's why he created us to be part of this plan. But believing in him takes us a big step of faith. What is it in 2016 you need to believe in God to do in your life? Is it to increase your faith in him? Ask him. Beg him. Plead with him. God, increase my faith. I am trusting in you. Not my works, not my attitude, not what happens, but just in you. God, I need you to do a miracle in my family. There is arguing, there is bitterness, there is hate. God, I am believing in you to work in me, to work in the life of my family to change things. God, I'm believing in you to tr take care of my finances. No longer is it, is it all about my budget, me figuring it out, but it's me being obedient what you've called me to do with my, my money. That's me getting, being obedient with my tithe. That means going above and beyond my tithe and giving an offering and being sacrificial in how I live my life. What do you need to grasp God this year? What do you need to set aside and believe in Him this year and not yourself? This is the first of new beginnings. And it starts with us. Because what's everybody in here? You're a part of this family of Christ. And if we'll get it right... And we will focus on God so much, I guarantee you, every person in that apartment complex, every house that goes that direction, everyone that works in the stores over there will know that something is different here and they will want to come and find out if we'll just get real with God. It starts here. Next week, we're going to talk one more step about this thing within our own selves that we need to work on. But in two weeks... I expect every one of us to bring somebody to pack this room out because the gospel of Jesus is going to be shared. We're going to be studying John 3 where the, one of the clearest pictures of Jesus as Savior comes. I'm begging you to plan and even start now inviting people to come meet you here on January 17th. But before that, I'm asking you right now to work in your own heart. And trust me, this is me. I'm I, I set most of my day outside of the two hours I set for Duke to watch them beat Boston College. Most of my day was in my office struggling over this message, struggling what God wanted to do in me. Wrestling. What is it, God? What is it? And I'm still working on those things. Will you wrestle with God? Will you ask him, what is it that I need to believe in you? What is it that needs to change in me that I might have a new beginning that you, Jesus, get all the glory and victory for? That will start off the greatest year of your life. Lastly, just real briefly, obviously this, this passage deals with alcohol. I'm not here to tell you whether you can or cannot drink alcohol, all right? To me personally, that is a personal conviction between you and the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you where I stand. It is a sin for me to drink alcohol. And here's why. Because before I came to Christ, I was a drunk. I, did, I drank alcohol so that I might get the courage to live the life I wanted to live and be who I wanted to be. Now, I'm very comfortable being a goofball, very comfortable in who I am in Christ. And I don't need anything else to help me in that. And I know that if I were to drink, my witness would hurt. People who knew me, people who know me, if they were thinking, well, he's drinking again, really, is there a difference in his life? That's what he, that was his crutch, that's what he did. I would ruin my testimony. It was very unwise for me to drink. I would say based on Scripture, obviously Scripture is very clear because people like to use this passage to say, well, Jesus turned water to wine so I can drink. You use this passage about the purity of Christ and coming to change the old law 
to show that he is, he is the complete one, you are missing this passage. In fact, you are adulterating the word of God. Don't ever use this passage to justify your alcohol. Sorry, that's a soapbox. I've, I've heard it so many times. It's, it's struggle for me. But if you do choose to drink, make sure you're, you are, as Paul said, not allowing a person to stumble. You should never, if, if you use alcohol and someone around you stumbles, you sinned. And I would say, personally, you probably can't get alcohol without losing your testimony in some way. I'm not saying it's a sin. I'm saying you might lose your testimony. And the greatest thing we have is our testimony. So just as Mary did, people, we were able to point people to Jesus, not to ourselves. I'm going to pray for the band come and sing. You know, maybe, God, maybe God's doing work in your heart right now. And you need to come up or make your seat an altar and just ask God and beg God to show you what needs to change in your life to surrender to him in 2016. Maybe there's someone in here and saying, I've believed in, about God, but I've never believed in God. You need to come up here. Come talk to me. I want to walk you through what it looks like to believe in God. And no longer just about God. So that you might have a relationship with him that will span all eternity. If you say this is a church, maybe a family of faith, where you want to be, make, your, make your home, please come let me know. I want to connect you to the leadership so that they can walk you through that process and this be the body of Christ you, you're, you've joined to make a change in the world and a change in your own life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. I thank you for the privilege it is to, um, man, just come to church. Lord, it's, so, it's such a blessing that so many people around the world don't have, that they can't come and just and publicly worship, publicly get together with other people and just enjoy time with each other and enjoy singing songs that, that praise your name. And God, I want you to get all the victory. God, we want you to get all the glory. As we looked at this, at this passage today, God, only a few people knew. But God, now the world can know that you're the one true God. And I pray that through my life, through the life of the people in here, through the life of family of faith, that the world might know that Jesus is the one true God. That no works I do will ever justify our lives, but only because of the atonement you did on the cross. God, may we fall in love with you. Lord, direct and guide our hearts that our new beginnings this year would be beginnings that reflect you and you alone. We love you, Lord. We praise your name. Amen.